Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here is where I get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and, and what drives them. Uh, today, I, I connect with a great chef, a cookbook author, and a, and a very humble and talented human being that I've admired most of my career. So let's discover his journey. Uh, chef Ed Brown is currently assuming the leadership of Restaurant Associates in as of January of 2022 as the chief executive officer of, I got to start the whole thing over. It sucked. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my energy is weird right now. I don't know why I can get myself situated. <laughs> Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here's where I get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them. Today, I connect with a great chef, a cookbook author, and a very humble and talented human being that I've admired for most of my career. Let's discuss his journey. Chef Ed Brown assumed the leadership of Restaurant Associates in January of 2022 as Chief Executive Officer, a promotion from uh, President of Restaurant Associates. So what is Restaurant Associates? Well, sit back. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. It's huge. Restaurant Associates is the best on-site dining management company in the industry. RA, as we call it, delivers hospitality excellence to premier clients in some of the country's top cultural centers, corporate accounts, educational facilities, and off-premise catering events. This list of clients is well over 175. Headquartered in New York City, Restaurant Associates operates a huge portfolio of corporate accounts, including Condé Nast, Warner Media, Sony, Google, Amazon, Tiffany & Company, Tapestry, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, and Capital One, as well as Harvard Business School and the Culinary Institute of America. Landmark cultural centers include the American Museum of Natural History, the Guggenheim Museum, and Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City, as well as the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, to name a few. <laughs> Did I mention that the list is well over 175 accounts? Well, so basically, RA is a really, really, really big deal dining management company, and Ed runs the show. So let's hear a little about his background. Once a chef, always a chef. For more than 30 years, Chef Ed Brown has cultivated a culinary prowess by working in some of the most celebrated kitchens in the world. His passion and talents have earned him wide acclaim, including numerous New York Times stars and a Michelin star. He varied experiences as synonymous with culinary innovation, quality food, and entrepreneurial spirit. A graduate of the prestigious Culinary Institute of America, Brown's professional life began at the New York Times three-star Maurice restaurant as sous chef, working beside Chef Christian de Louvier. After two years, uh, Ed Brown journeyed to Paris and in the kitchens of the famous Michelin three-star Louis, Car Louis Carton, Lucas Carton, as Chef de Partie Tournon. These are all huge um, the names and gigantic positions to be in them, so we've got to find out how it got there. After a brief stopover at the now shuttered but much beloved Judson Grill, Brown took over the stoves at the Sea Grill, the then gem of the Restaurant Associates family. During his 14 years as ex executive chef, Esquire magazine called the Sea Grill one of the best restaurants in the world, and Brown perhaps the most impressive talent in his field. Throughout Brown's career, he has earned an impressive 14 stars collectively from the New York Times for such properties as Marie Michelle Tropica, Judson Grill, and the Sea Grill, and two, all RA properties. Um, in 2008, Brown fulfilled his lifelong dream of owning his own restaurant and opened 81, the Upper West Side Eatery, and it was an immediate hit and earned a highly coveted Michelin star, which is highly unusual. Um, in March 2010, in light of the tumultuous economy, Brown made a decision to close the restaurant and pursue other opportunities that include a return to RA as the company chef innovator. Additionally, in 2009, he created the casual and authentic seafood eatery Edge Chowder House. In 2015, Ed Brown returned to the U.S. Open project where he reconceptualized 
Aces by Ed Brown, the premium level seafood restaurant that operates during the 14 days of the annual premiere New York event to this day. Brown is frequent guest on NBC's Today Show, CBS's Morning Show, as well as competitor on Iron Chef America and judge on Beat Bobby Flay. Uh, Ed Brown is the author of The Modern Seafood Cook, a comprehensive guide to buying and preparing seafood and fish. He has also contributed to other cookbooks, including The Updated Joy of Cooking, Chef Pierre Frenet's 60 Minute Gourmet, uh, Gourmet, as well as other publications. Busy man, great man, with a great career. But what we want to find out is, Ed, first of all, welcome and thank you for your time today. Where did it all start? Tell me about where, where were you born? And who, how, many, how many kids were in the family? How did you get interested in cooking? That's really what we want to know. First of all, thanks, Rick. It's great to be with you. And, you know, you talk about the OGs. You and I, you know, sort of parallel careers, similar ages, just very, you know, very exciting. It was a great time for us to come up being chefs, right? Because yeah. you know, we were right on that cusp of you, you could only be a chef, a real chef, if you worked in a French restaurant. And frankly, if you were French. Uh, and then we had sort of, you know, the leaders you know, a half a generation, a half a step ahead of us, uh, the guys like the Charlie Palmers uh, and others who who made that step out there and got recognized as American chefs. That 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 was almost an oxymoron back in the day. But we'll get back to that. So I, <laughs> it was just developing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was born and raised in the Jersey Shore, so been close to seafood my whole life. But we're in, we're in Jersey, uh, in Monmouth County, in. Uh, Ocean Township. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're by, it was by the sea my, my entire childhood. To this day, my mom, my two sisters still live down there. I was uh, one of five children right in the middle. Right, same here. And I was uh, definitely a middle child, and I think that, <laughs> well, frankly. What does that mean? What does being a middle child mean? Because I'm three of seven, so I, I, I want to just stop you for a second. What does that mean? I think there's, you know, a lot of stigma about middle child. To some extent, you have to survive on your own a little bit. And I think that, A, I did, and B, uh, it made me much stronger. Also, gave me a much closer tie to my mother and also to my grandmother at that time, um, which is really where my love for cooking comes from. Uh, and I say that my love for cooking comes from two places. One, I love to cook. And maybe pre pre that is that I love to eat, and if yeah. you love to eat and you love to cook, and uh, you know, and, and you 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 grow up eating good food, uh, it, it's it's an amazing part of your life. And so, uh, so I was a middle child, had two older brothers who hung around together, so that it excluded me. And then a big seven and a half year break until I had two younger sisters who were born, same parents. <clears throat> so I was really in the middle. And, and so, yeah, I grew up down there. My, my dad was, my dad was an accountant and he had restaurants as clients. And so my first jobs were at some of his clients and uh, uh, it, it was great experience to get into these kitchens that I was going to as a kid. I've eaten in these restaurants as a kid and I always was, you know, mystified by, wow, what it must be like behind the doors and, wish I could be doing that. And ultimately I did. And You're working around New Jersey restaurants from when you were younger then. Is that, is that correct? Well, I was still in high school. Yeah. Did but you know, did you know David Burke back then? I didn't know him back then, but he and I were probably a stone's throw from each other to be honest. Yeah, very much. He and I have relived that together many times. Uh, Mostly through drinking places. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's where you have your, your discussions of cuisine. Ed. Come on now. We know that. <laughs> so what's the, what ethnicity uh, is Brown? Um, what, what was it? Uh, who, who was cooking in your house? What, I mean, your dad was an accountant for restaurants and that obviously got your foot in the door and you got to be able to express, you know, uh, some sort of introduction to uh, the culinary fields, which of course you would pursue and become very, very well uh, established. But what was the, the impetus? Was uh, uh, What kind of cuisine was there at home? So at home was really, first of all, we ate fish like most people eat hamburgers in the rest of the country mm -hmm. because it was just everywhere. 
and it was not expensive at that time. At that time, that part of the Jersey Shore was still a big commercial port, which it really isn't at all anymore in that part of the Jersey. Um, and so, you know, I ate fluke, flounder, hake, you know, my whole childhood, like it was, you know, oh, we're having that again. Um, and, you know, simply cooked. My mom broiled it or she cooked it with onions or in the summer, I eat bluefish twice a week. Yeah. Um, Straight from the water. Straight from the water. And I'm like, the you know, probably next to you, the world's biggest proponent of bluefish. You know, people have me on programs to say, what's your favorite fish? Expecting me to name some like Japanese fish or <laughs> fatty toro. And I'm like, dollar for dollar, uh, I'll take a blue, I'll take a snapper blue same yeah. day out of water any day. Anytime. Right on. Oil, lemon, and sea salt. Goodbye. <laughs> Drop the mic moment. So it's, scre- it's screaming garlic for me. Oh, I don't like garlic. I do. <laughs> but but uh, but to, to the point was is that I grew up eating a lot of seafood, um, and you know had a garden, loved growing stuff, and I just thought it was the most amazing thing to go in a garden, harvest something, and cook it myself. Or if I've gone fishing, catch a fish and, and cook it myself. Uh, super rewarding. And it also, you know, was training me then, not that I had any clue what that was doing, but it was training me then about sustainability. When you, when you plant a seed and grow a carrot, you are not going to waste any part of that carrot because you feel like you've created this thing and you want to have all of it. And you knew how long it took from seed to get to that carrot, you're like, shit, I'm not wasting this. So, uh, so that was a big part of my formative years. And I happened, one of the jobs that I had was working at a seafood restaurant that jetted out right over the, uh, Belmar inlet. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was a seafood restaurant run by a German chef, uh, who had worked for another guy. He ended up owning the restaurant, but really his, 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 you know, his expertise was being a chef. Right. And his only the good news is for me as a young cook is that he, he only knew how to do things the right way. Mm-hmm. And so that was a big restaurant doing 600 covers on a Saturday night. And, you know, <laughs> cooked water, we were, you know, buying whole round fish was docks were right below us on the pier. We, so my first jobs were bringing the fish in, gutting them and scaling them before I was even allowed to cut them. Um, everything was done the right way. Unfortunately, you know, in that level of restaurant, uh, it's, it's not a good business for me. So you can't do volume that way. Does he, he, he refused to cut corners. Well, you know what? That instilled integrity in you, Ed, and that's great. It's a great time for you. A lot about cooking. In your, form, in your formative years to have somebody that's going to say, <laughs> this is how you, I, I, my career was, <laughs> I had a guy named Eugene Bernard. He was, his nickname was Boom Boom, Boom Boom Bernard. The guy was just like, uh, no, this is one way to do it. This is the way. He was from the south of France, and was he was an instructor at the Culinary Institute of America. Did you, did you have hear of or experience Eugene Bernard? No. Well, he yeah. became my mentor. It's just, it's it's a great way to. Um, you know, you don't know it at the time. You don't have any clues. As, as a kid that age, I was 20. I don't know what age you were at this point, but it, it just it instills in you your, your principles that you carry through for the rest of your career, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't, you didn't just, um, and, you know, work for a couple of places that your dad got you in the door. Come on now, he hooked you up, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're sous chef for uh, Christian Delivier. Yeah, the, the, you know, we, I don't know. For those listening, Christian Delivier was an incredibly um, respected, feared by many because he was a little Napoleon. I, I think you know he was a he was a, he was a tough he was a toughie to cook for, you know. So, what was that experience like? And how'd you how'd you become sous chef under Christian Delivery? I mean, I, well, you know, there was a few steps along the way. So, yeah. you no, know, especially in our time, nobody started anything as sous chef. Uh-uh. <laughs> So uh, actually, when I graduated CIA, my CIA mentor at the time was Roland Hennen, okay. who, who sent me to work at a great little restaurant in Nashville, which is like the Lutece of Nashville. A townhouse, wealthy couple, brought a chef from France, made this beautiful little restaurant. I went there, was there about a year and a half or so, 
when a classmate called me and said, hey, and, and he, in all the public restaurants at CIA, he was always saucier, I was always bossing me, fish is always the same. Mm -hmm. Called me from New York, he says, I'm working for Delouvrier at Maurice. I'm working the sauce side. There's an opening for Poissonnier. It's yours, but you got to be here in nine days. Gave up a job, gave up a girlfriend, gave up an apartment, drove to New York, and I was in that kitchen. In the Essex house, right? No, that was before. I was in the Parker Meridian. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. So I was in the Parker Meridian on 57th. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got there to the fish station, and you're right. It was like being in the Army. Uh Christian's workstation was right outside the elevator door that opened into the kitchen. Yeah. It was escaping, walking in front of him to arrive. <laughs> so when you, when you arrive to work the PM shift at 11 a.m. <laughs> and the schedule is like 2.30. So when you arrive at 11, he looks at you, pushes you up against the wall. And are, are we allowed to curse on this podcast? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> why, why are you so effing late? <laughs> uh, at 11 o'clock and then proceed to just like follow you around behind you like bah, 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 what, 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 what. And, yeah. uh, all day long, all day long. And uh, so the, the good news for me is that I have no problem being a soldier and I understand commitment and loyalty and uh, you know, keeping the head down, and I, I never took what he said personally. So uh, I was very successful in his kitchen and moved up fairly quickly. And even when I did become sous chef, I still owned the Poisson Station because Christian is one of the best cooks I know. Mm -hmm. But in particular, there's not a better saucier or charcutier. Actually, this guy making uh, wow. terrine pâtés was just amazing and his sauces we used to refer to his demi as melted budweiser beer bottles because it was and that there's loud. there's some there's some kind of noise is there some shuffling or something on the table some there's some kind of interference yeah. i'm having trouble hearing i'm sorry so you know uh but his his interest on the fish side he was happy to let me uh to, to control that so it gave me a little bit of edge to sort of be able to be out of the way of the, the hatchet, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, so I was successful. And we got along for, for quite a long time. And at that time, again, if you were going to be a real restaurant in New York, you had a, you had a consultant from France. Ours was Alain Sanderans from Luca Carton. Yeah. And a couple, two, three years in, he invited me to come to Paris to be <laughs> Paris. Those guys are like doctors. They were like doctors. They had, a, they, had a, they had a tie on underneath their chef coat, as I recall. These, these guys were like, you know, like scientists. They were, they were like scientists, doctors who walked in the, he'd walk in the kitchen with his tie and a chef coat open with his big tie. Yeah. And smoking a giant cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, this guy knew how to smoke them and he knew how to give them. <laughs> you got a couple cigars <laughs> yeah, a couple, but france was a terrific experience you know people say oh you must have really learned how to cook in france i did not learn how to cook in france i learned about the culture of france mm -hmm. living there i i learned to cook in my experiences in new york and especially with christian uh was my most formative high level high skill cooking and in France, there were just techniques and, and finesses uh, to how they uh, perfected some of these dishes. But frankly, uh, I was so I was more impressed and I realized how great our team was uh, back in New York because these were the dishes we were making in New York that we were replicating, I think, very much as well as they were, except we were doing three, amount, three times the amount of covers with half the amount of cooks. You crank it out. And, and you crank it out because that's the way you do in New York. Okay, so the sea grill um, is, I see Ed Brown, I think of sea grill. It is right on the skating rink, Lincoln Center. Ro Lincoln, right? Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Sorry, Rockefeller Center. <laughs> Getting old, Ed. So Rockefeller Center skating rink where the Christmas tree is. It's the epicenter of New York City, especially at Christmas, but not just exclusive to Christmas. And down below, 
with a beautiful glass, you know, windows all the way around the top. You're seeing all the action going on outside. Ed's got his kitchen and crew along the side walls and into the back. And he's putting out arguably the best seafood in, 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 um, in New York. You know, I'm competing with that at this point, as I say that, and I, and I say that with all respect that truthfully, you ran a, an, an unbelievable operation, you know, and uh, RA is, is just, you know, we're going to get into RA, you know, because, you know, you, you've had your, you know, you're, you're now, now you're, you're at the top. I mean, that's what could be possibly better. I'm not going to hear about that, but Seagrill, you know, um, I don't know. If you had to pick one location in your career that defined you, would you would you agree that Sea Grill or would it be Tropica or Judson Grill? I think they've all left. Uh, definitely not Judson Grill. I would say that, uh, first of all, my first post as chef, I was the youngest chef in New York City at that time at 23, hmm. uh, when Pierre Frenet anointed me as chef to Marie Michelle. That to where? Was Marie Michelle. Marie Michelle was on 56 between 5th uh, uh, and 6th. Wow. And when I, when I came back from France, Pierre said, when you come back from France, you go back and help Christian make his third star because he hadn't had it yet. Uh, knowing that, by the way, Pierre Freni was the companion on, on almost every dining trip with Brian Miller in those days. So yeah. he had some clue when that might happen, let's just say. And, there was some influence here. There you go. So he said, he said, you, when you come back, you need to oblige Christian to help him make his third star. And when you do, he didn't say if, he said, when you do, I will personally put you in a job as chef. That's six months, six years, whatever it takes. There you go. When I came back from France, Maurice made his third star five months later. Uh, and he, he put me at Marie Michel uh, as chef. So that was a very formative time. I was almost three and a half years there before joining Tropica, which was such an interesting restaurant on its own, uh, all formative. But I guess I would have to say that I, you know, I grew up and cultivated and matured at Seagrill, spending that many years there. Um, it really just became a, a big boy restaurant. And, you know, in every respect for the food, from the food we were making to the level of business that we were running, you know, the holiday period, in a holiday period, a Friday fish delivery uh, from our friend, the fish vendor, one of our many, but our friend, Louis, uh, you know, it would take two vans to deliver my order on Friday, and it would be about a $35,000 order. We're talking about 35000 15 years ago, right? Yeah. Wow. $50,000 order today, and that would just to get me through the weekend. That's insane. Yeah, and all fresh fish, all whole fish, we scraped, gutted, cut portioned everything in the whole full-time fish, fish butchers. Um, it was, it was a beautiful, it was a pleasure to be there every day. It was super hard work, yeah. but we were cooking great food and we had a great team of people who were all aligned in the same, uh, in the same mission. And so I was, for me, probably, you know, a, a big, a big part for me. So how has seafood changed for you? You know, now you, you and I, you know, I was on a different, I was, I was just on a, a few blocks away, you know, in, in the same neighborhood making, we're both, we're both vying for the same proteins, you and I, you know, we're, you know, Louis Razo was, it was a big uh, purveyor that he just referred to us. And, um, it, you know, we, we learned a lot through with and around, you know, um, deal, dealing with other big names, Slavin and you're going to, I don't know if you went to the market, but I would. Oh, of, course. of course you did. You know, we'd go to the market and we would try to create, establish our own relationships with purveyors, but it was hard because they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to deal directly with a restaurant because they had, they supply to Razo, they supply to the big purveyors. And if that word got back, then, then they'd get cut off, you know? So it was, it was a big, interesting business, but how's it changed? today fast forward now what's going on that you know you miss and and that you see maybe is it's better or, or or different however you want to see it yeah so what's changed a couple of things just to look back before i look forward is you know uh when you think about it you and i running seafood restaurants at the time we did we were running seafood restaurants before the days of bernadette 
made seafood restaurants famous. That's right. Uh, and probably at the time that uh, we were running seafood restaurants, probably less than 15 seafood only restaurants in New York City and versus today where there's probably 115 of them. Right. Um, and so we were very much specialized and we could get any amount of the best product. In fact, mm. suppliers were begging us, will you buy my black sea bass? Will you buy my scallops? Mm, maybe yes, maybe no, right? <laughs> what changed and also, also, you know, we had the, uh, we had the advantage, you and I, of really paying attention. And I, and I give you a lot of credit or I think you're brought probably one of the first to make me more aware in your mission towards sustainability long before sustainability was a thing, right. long before people even thought, how could we ever fish out the ocean? How could it ever be? It's endless. We'll get, it'll be there forever. Right. And so fast forward, there's a million seafood restaurants. Uh, so many of them that aren't very good. Uh, <laughs> the reason that we chose seafood besides the fact that we love it, it lets us be specialists. Yes. You know, you buy the, everybody, if you can purchase the best possible beef in the world, it, you know, barring cooking it a few minutes too long, you really almost can't screw it up. A uh, piece of fish requires so much more technique and skill. Uh, and not, nothing against cooking meat, but just you can screw it up in two seconds. It requires finesse. It requires yes. You're about. absolutely right. And you now have to vie for product because product availability is much less. Um, and you ha we have to make choices to choose product that is not uh, harming our environment by either overfishing or, or supporting certain aqua farms that are maybe farmed in the wild that are just polluting the crap out of the water and making black head zones. Bad, uh, bad players. Yeah, bad actors. Yes, 100% bad actors. You've got, you, you also have uh, impact on the environment. If if the method that a harvest or harvesting, I don't know, harvesting is the wrong word because that means you grew it. If they're going after wild and they're going and they're hunting it down with things that are destroying the environment in which they require to live, that's also a concern. So impact, you know, environmental impact is also, I listen, Ed, I didn't want to get into, the, I didn't, when, when it all came to my doorstep, I didn't want to get into the whole discussion. I really did. not I just wanted to cook like you. We just, you know, we have our backgrounds. I just want to get back to the kitchen, you know, and they're talking about swordfish and the problem with swordfish. Would you get involved in this campaign? Give swordfish a break. And I'm like, yeah, you know, because I've been going to the Fulton market and we used to buy a lot of swordfish at the water club. It was a big item. It was salmon or swordfish. That's, and then we did a lot of banquets, a lot of, you know, big weddings, a lot of big things. Something you could throw on the grill last minute, all in minute. And get it out, it was beautiful, right? But out getting good swordfish became a lot more difficult. So when Nora Puyon asked me if I would get involved, I said, hey, sure, no problem. Overfishing. They're, they're, you can't you can only get pups now, you know, under hundred pounds. And we used to be able to get markers, double markers, all these gigantic fish. And uh, that's all I wanted to know. And little by little, people were, wait a minute, since you're supporting that, there's also in you know over there's habitat destruction you know there's uh overfishing there's there's the the and, you know aquaculture good and bad good and bad you know there's there's so many different things Ed, that i didn't want to do it you know I, I was like almost it was almost annoyed when there was another you know uh no there's another like wait salmon are no good what do you mean farm salmon are no good this is when i there was a point in my discussion with environmental groups where I was supporting and trying to be, you know, you know, a good, good, good player with when they told me I wasn't allowed to have farm salmon farmed in dangerous program came out. I almost, I almost went to, to, to the mats with them, you know, I wanted to, I, I fought them until I, I saw for myself that, 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 that there are major uh, concerns and issues. And so everybody, everybody's trying to play, play nice together. So, um, what what category of fish do you find harder to um, to satisfy your needs in, in restaurant associates? Uh, as far as getting it, yeah, get. Um, you know, uh, s sourcing. You know, being able to source uh, things like great Debo fish, uh, black bass, uh, you know, diver scallops, all the stuff that you and I used to use like crazy. Yeah. Nobody wants to pay the price. They want it to be, you know, 
We want it to be cheap. You know, who, whoever decided, I'd like the best. And part of being the best is as cheap as it can be. Those two things don't go together. Would you ever go to a sushi bar and say, give me the cheapest thing you got? And that just, it doesn't go together. You don't need bargain sushi. <laughs> don't forget. But, um, you know, getting, getting the premium stuff has gotten harder uh, in any amount, right? If you're around buying, you know, 10 pounds or something, you'll find it and you'll pay a premium. But, you know, across our system, you know, when I need hundreds and hundreds of pounds of different things and in different cities, uh, it gets tougher. You know, yes, if I'm in Boston, I can reach out and hit hit Portland, right? And, right. I can hit Todd and other people, uh, you know, in, in New York, you've still you've still got Montauk and you've got Barnegat Light, you know, just south. You know, yeah, fine. But, you know, go to Sheboygan. And I just use it as the word of any place but the <laughs> coast. You know, any place but the Northeast Coast. You know, getting quality product is super tough. And you, and you pay like a double price premium uh, to, to get it, if you can get it. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, I had restaurants in Mandalay Bay for 13 years after that shooting. I decided I was over it. It wasn't worth it for me anymore. I'm 65. I, you know, I'm, I'm working with a company that I'm really happy with. So I'm a master development chef for a company uh, based out of Houston. Super, super happy, you know. Um, so I left New York in 2005 to come out to Las Vegas to pursue that. And I, and I live here. and This is where I develop my recipes for the company I work with. But I, so I never experienced 81 and I, and I regret it, you know, and I'd just like to hear your story about 81, you know, and, and I know the idea of having to let something go because, you know, I, I, I went through the same thing at your, my career are, you know, I, I was before, you know, before I do a podcast, I, I, I live with that person in my head for a couple of days. Just remember, wow, that's right. I remember it with Ed. We talked about rat all the time, blah, blah, blah. We don't have to talk about that. You know, that's not the only thing we have to talk about. You know, there's so much parallel to our career. And, and I've watched your decisions that you've made in your career. And I, I w- would have made the same exact ones, you know. I mean, and I have in, in parallel ways made similar decisions in my career as you. I'm not saying I'm you. I'm not saying you're me. But you and I were almost doing... I, I said the same earlier. I said we have par- very parallel careers, yeah. and, you know, and, and first of all, I just got a bigger mouth, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody ever said you didn't have a big mouth <laughs> and, it, and it served you well, Rick. It served you well. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, you know, you, I get it. I'm your guest on the show and you've given me a lot of props and I'm grateful, but you know, uh, Every, every bit uh, my peer or higher, what, what you did with seafood in this country and certainly in New York. And when you say you left New York, whatever, so many years ago, yeah. I'll tell you, Rick, that the mark that you made on New York, you may not be present in New York, but you never left New York. Wow. Uh, together with Charlie Palmer, Dave Burke, Waldy Malouf, Jean-Jacques Rachou, your name falls in the conversation every time. So, so you're still here in the in the gang. That means the world to me. I, I really mean that. You know, I feel very disconnected with New York. That's a long time to be away from the Big Apple. You know, yeah. But uh, I but get to live. I, I get to live vicariously through you and your story. So yeah. well, you're welcome back anytime. Oh yeah, thank you. My son lives there. I do get back once a year. So Def- next time I'm in New York for sure, I wanna I wanna hook up with you and just I don't know where do you work out of you you work out of uh, Rockefeller Center. No, so my so by the way, Seabro doesn't exist anymore, and so that's not our property any longer. Oh, okay. Uh, center has completely redeveloped that. There's not even a restaurant in that location anymore. So, uh, my office, my office is on uh, in in Midtown, um, and so when I'm in town, uh, I'm here at uh, you know near not too far from Penn Station. Right. Um, but at least fifty percent of the time, I'm traveling. We, you know, you say we have actually we have over 180 accounts. You know, you mentioned Google. Google is one of 180. In that one account, I have locations in 15 cities and two countries. So uh, at least 50% of the time, I'm traveling somewhere. Uh-oh. 
Did I lose you, Ed? No, nope. oh, now you're there. Something just came up on my computer. I'm the worst person in the world, tech. I'm not a tech guy at all. Uh, you know, it's so funny, you know, like, even yeah. now, like I do these new concepts and stuff. And so I'm now trying to work with, I, I just recently got an Instapot. Let me just put it to you that way. It's the first time in my career I've ever used a, a pressure cooker because I never lived in high altitudes and I always felt that that's what they were for. And what it, what it can, what it can do is just blows my mind. You can cook a, a beef tongue within an hour. You can do it perfectly octopus and all these things that I've never used in my career, you know? So it's an interesting part of my life now to be able to uh, still um, educate myself every single day. It's, and, and I can only imagine overseeing what, what the point I'm trying to get. It's not about me. This whole thing is the Ed Brown podcast is how you multitask to oversee 180. Okay. 180 is impressive. But just one of that 180 is 15. Do the math, folks. You know, I don't know if you've ever done it, Ed. It's just got to be over. To, it's got to be in the thousands uh, for individual. If you if you added it all up, no, I mean, it's crazy. How do you how do you keep track of all that? Well, listen, we have we have 10,000 employees, um, and you know about 1,500 chefs, and you know. The thing is, is that to make it work, you gotta you gotta have the right people. You've got to empower them to do their job. You gotta let them do their job, and then you gotta hold them responsible to do their job, and continually keep giving them resources that lets them do a better and better job. That's that's really my job, is to be part of making deals to grow the business and continue to empower and enrich the people who are running our business. The people who do it every day, the old Bocuse quote, right? Who's running your restaurant when you're not there because you're out doing publicity? He said, same people who are running it when I am there. Best freaking answer in the world. And I've said that a million times when I was running restaurants and I say it today. I I'm not running these restaurants. The people who work for us are running them, yeah. but I'm giving them the gas to drive the car and I'm, I'm, I'm giving them the tools they need so that they can do a great job. That's culture. That's all, you know, that's, it's, it, it's a real simple word to say, but it's a real hard thing to accomplish. Cause to me, throughout my career, the, the, the most poignant and the hardest goal to obtain is to have your, is to create that culture and within that culture to actually have someone care. If they, once an employee cares about your culture, you've, you've, all you got to do then is tip the puppies back, tip the puppies back in the box. That's so there's to it, you know, but to get there, <laughs> good luck. This is like that magic trick when you say, okay, we never met before. Right. We didn't talk about this in advance. What you said, and you probably can't see what this says on camera, but this is a crowd reading. This is a crystal that I give to people who do a great job in our company. Uh -huh. And it says care. And the C-A-R-E stands for a few different things. That's sort of the core of our company. But it says care. Start with delicious. Be empathetic, grateful, and humble. For me, those mm -hmm. things, you can drop the mic. Everything else falls after that. Yeah, that's just so true. I, I'm covered in goosebumps. I swear to you as I speak to you, I'm um, completely goosebumped over because, ah, man, I, it's emotional. This the love, I would do this again, Ed, is insane. I can tell you, I could complain. I could sit around like a curmudgeon hitting at a bar going like, oh, shit, these people, oh, my God. And all that. You know, I could do this for hours. I would do it again. I'd go right back and go, yeah, yeah. That's you the thing. And there were lots of hard parts, and there were lots of uh, struggles professionally, personally. Ugh. I mean, years of us being a chef in our generation, the sacrifice was really rough. Uh, if you wanted to achieve something that, that you and I both have achieved, uh, it was rough. It was rough. But, you know, it, it, it was worth every bit of it. Uh, I wouldn't change anything. And it's one, you know, the cliche thing of saying, well, you got to love it. it. It couldn't be more true. If you didn't love it, it would be a torturous job. Um, but I love it. I, I run to, I get up early. I run to work every day. Uh, Unfortunately, not run, run. <laughs> <laughs> Slower run. I get up mentally running to work. Uh, and I work, you know, late into the night. I work at some point every single day. Uh, when I travel, I can't wait to be out in the field and see our teams, be with our teams, 
uh, and I have a huge advantage. My huge advantage is that I have street cred, right? I'm not, I'm not the CEO of the company who is a businessman who now runs the business. I'm the CEO and, you know, I promote that it's a chef driven company. We've always said that I am actually friggin' driving this company and I am the chef, sure. and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's an, it's an amazing moment in time. I'm so happy for you. I swear Thank to you, you. you know, I'm, and, and, you know, you'd think I'm throwing props at you because I'm on a podcast. Nobody's watching a podcast. People are listening to us are bored in the car, you know, or, or seriously, or the foodies. And we, and I appreciate everyone that listens truthfully. I'm not saying that in a, in a throwaway in manner. It's, it's just, you know, we're just two guys trying to talk about a field that means so much to us. And I, I don't want to see uh, it forgotten. The, the struggle, the, 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 you know, the, the whole process, the creation of the cultures, the disappearance of those cultures, but those like yourself and myself and what I call the original gangsters still pushing that culture, you yeah. know, and, um, and you're doing it in a big, 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 big way. Yeah. So I, I uh, take my hat off to you. I really, truly do. Hey, one of, one of the things that I'm happy to see is that one of my sons uh, became a chef and uh, went to CIA, graduated, uh, worked in a few places. He's now working for us. And, you know, he, he, as a child, you know, obviously not in my very formative years, but obviously, you know, in the last 26 years of his life, uh, he, he's seen a lot, a lot of different places and changes for me and knows what the struggle is supposed to be to get to where you're supposed to get. And what, what, what the cost of that is, and I don't mean that you should suffer, but there is some suffering, just the work that you have to do. Um, and he actually gets annoyed with some of his peers because they complain that it's too hard or they expect that things be given to them or that it be easy. And, and he knows how it happens. And he's like, listen, that's not how it happens. The sooner you realize, that, you know, you don't you don't come out of the womb born as uh, as Bobby Flay or any other TV chef, and if that's the route you want to take in life, great, good luck. But you know. <laughs> Flay always gets beat up. I love it. <laughs> tell you something, Bobby and I, and you as well. You know, Bobby and I were opening restaurants at this our first restaurant at the same time. Sure. Uh, when I opened Tropica, he was opening Mesa Grill, and he and I were very friendly in those days. Still, but saw each other a lot and Bobby's an outstanding cook. Forget about chef, forget about son. He's an outstanding cook, which is the best thing you can say about a chef Yep. Uh, and has an, a massive respect and passion for food. The mm -hmm. fact that he became an entertainer with food as his medium, good for him. I mean, he's, but he's still a restaurateur and he still cares about food. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't, th I don't think he's any different from us at the root, uh, you know, we're just not cute enough. I guess I guess my hair is the wrong color. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so, um, I want to make sure that I get you a sample of uh, Forever Oceans. We we were calling it Kahala, but I, I think right now we're we're calling it Hamachi because it's more understandable. It's a great amberjack product. And a free charge just for you to play around with and, and hopefully get some feedback from me if you, if you like it. But there's certainly no pressure to do so. So I just, uh, you know, I want you to put that, I want to put that on your radar because it's, it's a Rick Moon and endorsed company. <laughs> I haven't said that at any podcast, but I just did because um, of the integrity of the, of, of the infrastructure of the, the infrastructure of the company. It's got an amazing amount of integrity. And I believe that, with integrity comes quality. And, uh, and I want you to, without pitching you on anything, because that's stupid, I want you to I want you to feel it, touch it, smell it, taste it. So I'll, I'll send it to your home if you want, if you want, whatever you want. Great. I look forward to it. I'm a huge Jack fan. Yeah. Um, so look forward to it. It's good. I mean, for, for, for the, the first generations are coming out you know, in, within a matter of a month or two. So we're good. Now, so, when I when I, when I, you know, speaking of, of aquaculture, when I wrote my book, it came out in 94, but I really wrote it in 90, and I was in transition between a couple of places. It took time for me to finish it. But when I, wrote that, when I wrote that book, 
I spoke about aquaculture. And in 1990, aquaculture wasn't really very popular. They were like, well, why would you eat a farm fish when you can eat all the wild fish is all there for you? Like, oh, of course. course. I, I said, there will be a day. There will be a day where not only is, will farming get better, but it will be a necessity. And so uh, if only I had bought stock in that idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I was always saying invest in solar, invest in, uh, you know, the electric cars and all that because, uh, you know. But the question is, did you? <laughs> no, I don't do that stuff. I like to work hard for my money. I, I don't like to invest and just have money fall on me, apparently. <laughs> well, I've always been of the mentality, if I need more money, I have to work harder. I mean, and that's, and, and you know what? I'm never retiring, ever. I figure if I wake up one morning, and I'm standing at the stove, and I'm sautéing a couple of eggs, and then I go to put a go to flip them, and I fall back, and I I drop dead right there. I win. I won. I'm doing exactly what I love, what I've done my whole life. Yeah, I've always said I can always work. I'll never, I'll never be without a job. No, no, I've never since I was 12 years old. I've worked every single. I never took a summer off to travel with a backpack through Europe, but I've been to Europe. I worked in restaurants, you know, George Blanc and Mona and Mona, you know, is is with Charlie Palmer. And the experiences are uh, something that I cling on to right now you know, at this point of my life. And to be able to share them with, you know, icons like you. You're an icon to me, yeah. you know, forget it. You know, let's just let's let's call it what it is. When you know we didn't uh, get to hang out that much, probably you you're probably still alive today as a result. I don't know how I lived through it. You know, I was a little bit of a loose cannon, I think is what I was called. And I have overheard being used as a descriptor of this guy. And I, and I hear stories about me from years ago that I just don't believe. I'm like, oh, I'm a sweetheart. Yeah, believe it, Rick. They were true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's what made us who, who we are. And we didn't get in deep trouble back then for it. So uh, let's just pretend it never happened, except that when we closed the door, it's like... We're going to talk about real stories. It's like that, that, that old adage, you have to look over your shoulders. All right, all right I'm going to tell you a story, Burke. <laughs> you know, you know the, a book is being written on David Burke. Do you, you know a guy named Batman in New York? Of course. Yeah, Batman's writing the, uh, the, 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 the book of Burke. So that was, it was I, inter I interviewed him, and I think. Uh, I don't think that podcast ever got aired because it was just wasn't wasn't PC enough. <laughs> Mona, let me tell you. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I told him that. Oh man. But I've been fortunate enough to talk with this, do interviews with Jacques Pepin. You know, I haven't done Rashu yet. I wonder if I could he mumbled when he was younger. No, let me tell you something. So I think I told you we had a, a reunion lunch with Waldy, Charlie, and Jean Jacques. Yeah. I hosted it at one of our restaurants. Thanks for inviting me, by the way. That's great. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, it, he, he looks and acts better than ever. Sharp. By the way, you know, we're all like dressed like this these days. Right. He can three piece suit, tie, yeah. uh, wine for lunch. Full-on discussion, you know, with three three of us who all know him in different ways, recalling every single story, adding to it, uh, and, and he's about to do it. So let me Can know. We do it again, Ed. Please, seriously. Oh. You, no. You make your way here and give me a. Uh, no, I'll I'll fly there. I don't care. I'll, I'll walk there. I, I, that has to happen before uh, God forbid he passes away. I need to I need to reconnect with him. I want him to meet my my wife, my current wife. Okay. That's a long story, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's he's uh, uh, still as great as ever. Uh, you know, I stay, I, I, stay, I, I stay in touch with Christian Delivery as well. Wow, uh, see him every now and then. I usually I will send. He lives out in North Jersey. I'll send a car to go pick him because he doesn't drink and drive or doesn't like to drive at night. Right, send a car to pick him up in Jersey, bring him in, have dinner, send him home tell stories until we're blue in the face, drink a few bottles of wine. It's like, you know, it's fantasy for me. It's, it's, I mean, 
See, these are our heroes, right? Our idols. No kidding. That's why, I mean, to me, <clears throat> like I'm even talking with the Machiones. Mar you know, Mario Machione is in Las Vegas right now. He wants to meet with me uh, later this week. You know, because we're trying to get back together. We're trying to, we're trying to piece all the pieces back together. It was such a mad pace. You know, at this point of our lives, we've been given pause. We could have COVID or whatever. And now I think I'm a little bit more introspective and emotional and about um, everything that we're talking about. You know, to sit and talk to Rashu. I will never, uh, that, 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 that means the world to me, just to be able to, I mean, I don't even, I'll, I'll, I have your contact info, I'm going to make sure that you pass it on, I'll give them a call, but uh, I, I would love to organize a, a small gathering of yourself, Charlie, myself, whatever. Anybody else want, we can do it in a different way. It was just good to do it with a few of us, because you really got him, you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one for a couple of hours. You know, if you have a big reception, you know, you're not really. No, I don't want that. I want a, a small. Yeah. yeah. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. And he's going to pull out a deck of cards at the end and start playing. Last time, that's what he would do. Last time I saw him, he shut the restaurant. He'd start pulling out bottles of wine and wants to play cards. He's so funny. What a great man. One of the most generous guys I ever knew, right? So, uh, you know, when I was working at Marie Michelle, he, yeah. was, he was very friendly with her. And so we would often dine at his restaurant, she and I. We'd have nights out to sort of, you know, get experiences. La Côte Basque? Yeah. So we'd go to La Côte Basque, and, you know, we would take a few minutes to order, or we thought we'd be ordering, and then the waiter comes to see us, and then Rashu comes to say, see us. He says, yeah, you ordered? Forget that. It's not happening. And then comes, then comes the ice tower with caviar. Then comes lobster, and then comes Dover sole. Big, big wines, like really big wines that I wouldn't have the balls to order if I had the money. Yeah, uh, but just just kept coming, coming, and coming. He's just All a right. guy. All right. You've heard it, folks. We're going to be interviewing John Jacques Rashu on an upcoming podcast. Come hell or high water, <laughs> holy smokes. Ed, I've kept you almost an hour now, and I just wanted to uh, start to wind it down and say how much I appreciate it. I could talk to you forever, and I hope to catch up with you in New York. You're definitely going to get some fish from Forever Ocean sent your way, so I'm going to follow up with you on that for feedback. And thanks for sharing like your life, middle 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 child, New Jersey father with his connections getting to restaurant jobs and all of a sudden the next thing you know you're you're in with the big players and you've, you've turned yourself into the, an amazing amazing place to be right now i think i, I just can't can't foresee you uh, slowing down and that just makes me thrilled that's 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 the plan and i appreciate you having me on i think it's really cool what you're doing and what you've always done and like you say you know i was thinking about your career just like you were thinking of mine before we got together and the, the amount of parallels is, is amazing from where we've worked, from who we've worked with, from how hard we've worked, uh, to owning our own places, to having to shutter our own places. We've been through a lot. It, it makes you stronger. If you survive, it makes you stronger. Not everybody survives it. Yeah. If you survive all of that, it makes you stronger. Uh, and then you get to be an expert like you are now. You're an expert and it's a different type of job. You're not humping it every day. You're using all that experience that you have yeah. to make great things. And I feel guilty. It's it's too easy. You know, don't tell my uh, my people that I work for. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, I can I can make sorbets. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. I love my job. Love my life. Love you, brother. Thank you so much, Ed Brown, for uh <laughs> giving us some insight into your life. You're the man. All my best. Continued success. Thanks for having me, Rick. I really appreciate it. A lot of gratitude towards you. That guy's a brother. Take yeah. care. Bye. Foreverocean.com.